click on one of those letters, either A or B, the red light should flash um, on your clicker. Um, if for any reason it is not working, please raise your hand. We have extra clickers, and we will uh, have our staff uh, bring one to you, uh, but you can see how it works. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce um, a proposition. We're going to ask all of you to vote on that uh, proposition, and then we're going to go ahead and have our debate. And after you listen to our terrific speakers, um, one for the proposition and one against, you're going to get a chance to vote a second time. And uh, so we're going to see how your, uh, your opinion uh, changes. So with that, I think we're going to move uh, to the first proposition. So our first proposition is uh, on the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And I think we're going to put up the, uh, the slide there in just a, there it is, OK? The Belt and Road Initiative will achieve China's desired strategic and economic gains. So as you all know, the Belt and Road Initiative is President Xi Jinping's signature strategy uh, to further Chinese interests around the world. It's called the BRI, and it's designed to enhance connectivity and cooperation among more than 60 countries spanning from the United Kingdom to Egypt uh, to Indonesia with all roads leading back to Beijing. If successfully implemented, the Belt and Road will also ease pressure on China's domestic market by creating outlets for excess capacity in China's industrial sectors. Some observers believe that BRI is the key to increasing Chinese economic influence and redefining its role as a leading global power. So to discuss whether China will successfully achieve these ambitious strategic and economic gains, we have two terrific speakers, um, and I will introduce them in turn. Uh, to my right is uh, Professor uh, Zhou Fang Yin, who is director of the Center for China's Regional Strategies at Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. And he is the chief editor also of uh, the Journal of Strategy and uh, Decision Making. And then on my left, we have Dr. Joshua Eisenman, who is a senior fellow for China Studies at the American Foreign Policy Council and an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin's LBJ School of uh, Public Affairs. So with that, we will start with Dr. Joe. Thank you. So this is okay. So thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation from the China Pro Power Project CSIS, and uh, good morning, everyone. So it's my honor to be here and to have the opportunity to participate in today's conference and to share with you my personal understanding of the BRI and its possible rule for the realization of China's national interests. I will argue for the opinion that the Belt and Road uh, Initiative will be hopeful for China to achieve its desired strategic and economic uh, gains. In order to have a reasonable discussion on this top topic, I should first have a brief discussion on the strategic goal of China. According to the 19th CPC National Congress held in Beijing last month, China's national goal was determined to realize the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. This consists of two parts. The first one is to finish building a moderately prosperous society in all respects and achieve the first contemporary goal in 2020. The second one is to develop China into a great modern socialist country in 2050. At that time, the Chinese nation will be become a proud and active member of the community of nations. From a careful reading of different Chinese government documents published in the past several years, it's notable that the Chinese policy goals always put a development at an especially important position, and the stress to maintain the political system and the social stability. China does not set a clear goals for international status and influence, but focus on improving international environment where the core interests be maintained. The BRI is not a strategic goal. It's more of a policy measure, 
also a highly comprehensive one, and it will last for a long time. In general, Chinese government does not clearly identify international strategic goals and leaves a relatively large ambiguity space for the setting of strategic goals. However, there is no doubt that a relatively clear direction is behind it. From this perspective, the question that we are going to talk about today, where the BRI contributed to the realization of China's strategic goal, can be turned to Another one, that is, when an initiative is uh, in higher con consonance with the general strategic direction and the strategic pursuit of China, in my opinion, the consistency is clear, real, and at a higher level. Now I will discuss about the strategic significance of BRI from China's perspective. At the present, China is the single most important rising power in the international system. For the rising power, its police measures can be say as uh, achieving the uh, if a police measure can achieve the foreign effects, we can say that it is a successful one. First, it hopes to reduce the security pressure uh, faced by the rising power. Second one, it hopes to expand its international influence. Third, it hopes to expand the long-term strategic space and expand its influence in the international society. And, uh, but all needs should be under precondition that it does not bring too much or even unbearable economic burden to the rising power. If a police can achieve the, just mentioned the three effects, it would be said as an ideal one to the rising power. Of course, if it would be better if the economic cost is lower. China as a rising power now faces two major international challenges. First is the possible strategic squeeze and uh, constraint, or even strategic containment by the hegemon. Second is the alienation and the overt and the covert position of other countries. To each of the two challenges will be essential for China to rise smoothly and peacefully. So it's most a sino US bilateral issue that how to relieve the pressure from the United States. And uh, the Chinese government has made a lot of efforts, but uh, this is not what I'm go going to talk here. I would like to focus on the role of BRI in influencing the attitudes of other countries. The first point I'd, I'd like to make is that BRI hopes to change the perception of many countries to the strategic intention of China. At the preliminary stage of the promotion of the initiative, some foreigners tend to regard it as a strategic disguise or strategic deceit of the rising power. Even some Chinese people also hold this kind of idea. As the, as the initiative is implemented extensively and deeply, it's hard, to, hard and hard for people to believe this idea because of follow, following several reasons. The first thing, a country should not invest so much resource and efforts for strategic deceit. China did not to work so earnestly for a disguise. If the initiative were to work a strategic deceit, China should have spent as little as possible, as long as it is enough to cheat the others. But this is not what really happening. As we can see, the initiative has been written into the newly revised party constitu constitution. Constitution, it has been further institutionalized and socialized inside China. Secondly, the initiative is so widely implemented that the strategic value of many places is quite dubious. Anyhow, it's impossible that so many places in the world are all of strategic significance to China's rise. Certainly, there seems to be a weak link between the content of the, the, the initiative and the strategic goal of the rising power. The link is too long, and the causality is not very reliable. So therefore, the BRI is not a deceiving strategy. In this case, according to the assumption of rational nation in international relations theory, the initiative should be in accordance with the national interests recognized by the Chinese government. It's an effective embodiment of China's preference and strategic intention. Uh, my second point is that uh, 
BRI hopes China to attract, attract more support in the international society. China has started a cooperation with many countries under the name of the initiative. It has been an important China platform and method for China to maintain and promote close relations with a lot of countries. Since September 2013, there has been more than 70 countries that have signed MOUs or agreements related to Belt and Road. And we mentioned Belt and Road strategic cooperation in the joint statements. Some of the exp expression in the cooperation document is mainly an embodiment of political intention and willingness without much binding force. Nevertheless, it's of uh, symbolic significance for the promotion of bilateral relations. The great effort made by Chinese government to propose the initiative in the past four years indeed tightens the relation of China with a lot of countries. Many of those countries feel that the Chinese government now is attaching more importance to the to name. For example, China's relation with South is, is, with South Asian countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bangladesh are greatly enhanced in this process. So are its relations with almost all Middle Asian countries and some South Asian, South Asian nation, countries, such as Malaysia, Indonesia, now DPR, and Myanmar, and also its relations with New Zealand and Pacific Island countries and many African countries. Personally, I did not know much about the Pacific Island countries before 2014. As they are on one of the five roads of the Belt and Road, I have been there for three times since 2015 for investigation as a common Chinese scholar of international relations. I stood in five Pacific Island countries, including Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, and Vanuatu for around one month Accumulatively. We also invited many Pacific people to visit Guangdong and to get a better understanding about the situation and the foreign policy of China. And the new assistance of China brings practical and visible changes to Pacific Islands. And the local people are happy about that. The, re the relation and, uh, of China and island countries are truly enhanced to a much higher level. An important indicator for this is the change of the number of countries that support China in some landmark events, such as the AIB and the Belt and Road Forum of Internet Co Cooperation held this year May in Beijing and some others. Some may say that some of those countries' support for China is only superficial. This may be true for some countries. But even superficial support is of political influence. When more countries publicly support China, such an initiative, a kind of international environment would be created, and this will have an influence on the, on the perception and the expectation of other countries toward China, which also reduce the objective and subjective costs for them to support China, to support China in other events. And this is not the original goal of BRI, however, however, BRI indeed strengthened the relation with China and many countries and hopes China to find out a lot of new partners, some of whom may offer support to China on other issues so as to gain, gain benefits from BRI. The third point is that the effective promotion of BRI will keep China from being strategically uh, uh, we are keep China from being strategically isolated and also forestall the attempt of some countries or a group of countries to isolate China strategically and economically. BRI quickly increases the number of countries that would like to make a deep economic cooperation with China. It put China into a better position as not so worried about to be isolated by any kind of regional economic arrangement. Consequently, China is more confident when facing any possible economic arrangement, like a TPP or TTIP or CPTPP or anything else. China's situation may impact the motivation of other countries to establish 
a large regional economic arrangement to exclude China, reduce their insurgism, and even prevent their efforts in advance. The fourth point is that, okay, see, the increase of supporters to China in the world also results in a higher cost for neighboring countries to contend, contend with China and reduce the, the possibility of their success. It also has some impacts on the prospect of possible strategic competition between China and the United States in East Asia. The promotion of BRI enables China to maintain considerable support in the region and to be more confident in coping with any crisis. The fifth point is that the positive effects of BRI in the world improve China's diplomatic confidence and make it to be more active in the international society. In the past four years, the positive feedback to BRI in the world is an encouragement to China's foreign policy transformation. Correspondingly, we can say that the strategic resource that resources that China invested to diplomats after 2013 have been growing rapidly. However, China's diplomats still generally focus on economic cooperation and global governance. I just mentioned the five effects, effects that the Bird and the Road Initiative has. One year, and the, the BR have water above five effects, but it is not decisive to any of them. It takes a long time to produce the effects, and it will have these effects in the long run. In fact, the effect of BRI will be more significant if China face suffers from higher international pressure. And uh, its effects will be decreased if China is in a sound and a favorable international environment. So this is uh, something uh, a paradox. So, uh, uh, so my time seems to be run out. Well, I will stop here. Thank you. All right, great. I, I, I failed to read the initial results of your polling, and hopefully that wasn't just testing, but um, we had 42% yes and 36% against uh, the proposition before we started. Um, so we will be voting again, of course, after we finish our debate. Josh Eisenman, over to you. Well, thank you uh, so much, Bonnie. Uh, I've got some ground to make up here in your initial decision making, so I'm going to do my best. I want to begin by, of course, thanking Bonnie, thank you CSIS, and thanking Dr. Joe for an excellent opening remarks. And I want to associate myself with the remarks of uh, Senator Cornyn earlier uh, today. I'm a Longhorn, and I support Senator Cornyn's remarks. Uh, my question is, you know, this is very similar to things we were talking about on the Hill 10 years ago. I want to see if we can actually push it through this time, that's my hope. Um, so let me begin with the, with the words of uh, Professor Yan Shui Tong at Tsinghua University, who said in a recent op-ed, East Asia's strategic importance to China is greater than any other region. If China invests its strategic resources in East Asia, the strategic gains generated will be much more beneficial than any other region. But if China looks beyond its own neighborhood and puts its strategic resources into regions such as Europe and Africa, the Middle East and Latin America, it will reap only a limited harvest. And it's because I agree with the words of Professor Yan that I would ask you to change your vote if you have it, and join me in negating today's resolution that the Belt and Road Initiative will achieve China's desired strategic and economic gains. Now, I may accidentally slip into the word obor, which is the old terminology. I apologize for that initially. Dr. Yan Shui Tong is not alone, however. I spent the last two summers in China, and I was hard pressed to find one Chinese scholar who in private company would support the Belt and Road Initiative. So why then were, such, were Chinese professors so adamantly against it? Patriotic, well-meaning Chinese professors. So I think today what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to walk a mile in their shoes. I'm going to try to place myself in the role of a Chinese policymaker, and I'm going to ask you to join me in Zhongnanhai 
and put yourself in the role of a Chinese policymaker. And as Chinese policymakers, we should follow Deng Xiaoping and we should seek truth from facts. So what should matter to us here is not whether a particular policy is worth pursuing based on facts. The ultimate bottom line in making any new policy should be the principle of do no harm. If the preponderance of the evidence stated here suggests there is a sizable chance that one, the policy will fail to achieve its objectives, or two, worse, it will backfire and harm China, then I would argue we ought not adopt that policy. In short, I think we can all agree that any policy that leaves China worse off is not a policy we should vote for here today. And this preponderance of the evidence standard is important because it's a lower standard for the affirmative here today than the beyond a reasonable doubt standard that is in U.S. criminal courts, but it also places him a positive duty. He must demonstrate to you that the preponderance of the evidence suggests that this is a policy that will be successful. Regardless of whether or not you believe a word that I say here, if he can't convince you, you should be no voting no on the resolution here today. In short, in order to adopt this policy, you should, one, find his arguments succeed in convincing you, or if I can provide you evidence that the chances of success are low, or third, I can provide you evidence that the risks to China are too great to proceed. Simply put, one Belt, One Road is a bold and risky initiative, and like all bold and risky initiatives, it should be undertaken with great caution under the principle of do no harm. So what is One Belt, One Road? Let's speak specifically here. It is a potentially $1 trillion effort to lubricate the joints of trade, given angioplasty to the arteries of trade. It does this through direct lending at very low rates through Chinese policy banks, particularly the China Development Bank and the Silk Road Fund, which then use that money to hire Chinese firms, and then the foreign companies then countries then pay China back either in kind through oil or minerals or in cash. So what would success look like? Well, economically, China would have to deploy its excess capacity. It has 30 million extra men, as many people as in Canada. It's got excess capital. It's got excess construction capacity. China would also have to be repaid. These are loans, after all, and people don't loan money expecting not to be repaid. This would also have to succeed in internationalizing the renminbi, an already stated policy of the Chinese government. Culturally, President Xi has said this will turn China into, quote, a major cultural power. I would question this and ask Dr. Zhou in his rebuttal to please explain this to me. China is a country that 40 years ago had a cultural revolution. We see Chinese friends are all wearing Western clothes, living in perhaps a Western style house, perhaps driving a Western car. What is China as a cultural superpower? I'd ask him to help me understand this. Politically speaking, China's influence would have to go up. And of course, Dr. Joe mentions this in his remarks. But if at the end of the day, China's influence does not rise, one belt run road cannot be successful. Strategically speaking, according to Professor Di Dongsheng, my friend at Renda, this would provide an alternate solar system to the U.S. solar system. It would prevent the U.S. and other countries, as Dr. Zhou said, from isolating China. That is part of this initiative. So as the negative, I'm going to make three types of arguments in my remaining 10 minutes. First, I want to show you why the arguments Dr. Jose presented to you should not be convincing. Second, I want to provide you five reasons why I think this initiative is unlikely to be successful. And third, informed by recent history, I'm going to provide you a list of six potential crises, and any one of them should be enough to get you to vote no on today's resolution. First, in dealing with uh, Dr. Joe's comments, he says that uh, through TPP and other measures, the U.S. will isolate China. I would propose to you the U.S.-China relationship is the largest trade relationship the world has ever known. The U.S.-China trade deficit for one year is worth more than China-Africa trade with all countries both ways combined. There is no isolation of China. That is a fallacy. I would ask you to throw that argument out. Second, I suggest that he prevents us insufficient evidence because I don't truly understand he hasn't laid out clearly what China's strategic and economic games should be. I will do that for you. I would ask him to do that more clearly. And third, I would suggest that his comments are overly optimistic. All right, uh, before you invade Iraq, it's easy to say what Iraq will look like. Before you invest in Sudanese oil, it's easy to say what your results are going to be. But at the end of the day, I believe we have to take a much more pragmatic approach and understand that once we get on the ground, this is going to be far more difficult. So. Let me provide you some reasons why I'm dubious that One Belt, One Road can be successful. First, it's politically driven. This is driven by the Communist Party of China, and as Dr. Zhou correctly said, it is now enshrined in the constitution of the party, and the party is a political organization. Politics in the lead is not a very good way to ensure uh, uh, economic growth, whether that be in terms of the uh, Great Leap Forward, 
which I have here. These are the Great Leap Forward announcements, and we all know how that turned out. Politically driven economics is bad policy, I would suggest to you here today. Second, it's rooted in conceptions of state-to-state -state relations, which I argue are neo-imperial. I myself attended the China Eurasia Forum in Xinjiang, and I watched the behavior of these foreign countries towards the Chinese leaders sitting in their big, red, fluffy chairs. This was neo-imperial, and that is a question for us today. Can a neo-imperial strategy, one of building a separate solar system, truly be successful in this globalized world? I'm dubious. Third, China has done a lot of domestic debt but externally, this size of external lending is questionable on, on its face and is therefore quite risky. In fact, China has a pretty mixed record. In listing the countries he has, Professor has left out Sudan, Venezuela, Sri Lanka, and Angola, all countries where this policy has been unsuccessful and sometimes spectacularly unsuccessful. And a fifth, the cultural objective. I'm dubious that China can go into these culturally thick areas, mostly Islamic areas, and spread its culture, spe specifically using an atheist party to do so. I think there are questions here. Now, in my remaining time, which I don't know how much I have, um, <laughs> seven, okay, great. Let me lay out some potential crises that I think are realistic based on the history. First and most obvious, a systemic debt crisis. A global financial turndown results in the fact that these countries cannot repay China. We saw this in the 1980s when Wall Street banks lent heavily to developing countries, only to ask the IMF to bail out these countries and therefore the banks. But now we're working beyond a net. One trillion dollars is far beyond anything the IMF or anybody else could bail out. If this kind of problem occurs, it's going to be systemic, it's going to be global, and it's going to be big. And there's going to be no one to run to to help. And that kind of systemic default crisis is a critical and should be front and center in your mind when you're dealing with this type of loans. Systemic default crisis also could affect China domestically. Infrastructure, which is what One Belt Run Road is building, rarely turns a profit. So even if we don't have a major crisis, it's highly likely, as we've already seen, countries will return to Beijing asking to renegotiate their loans. And when they do, we will see a systemic moral hazard problem, where country after country goes back to China to renegotiate, renegotiate, and renegotiate. This can't be successful. This, the problem be made even worse if China follows the lead of the US and securitizes these loans. If they take these loans, divide them into bonds, and sell them into you, the Chinese people, or worse, through the bond link to Hong Kong, to me, into my pension fund. This kind of securitization is what the US did with bad housing loans, and we know how that turned out. But whether your loan be backed by a bad loan to Tajikistan or a bad house, it's still a bad loan. And this could create a systemic crisis as Chinese are in increasingly involved in the bond market. Security crisis is also highly likely here, and we've already seen this in Libya. As the security crisis devolves, China has been forced to save its people and save its property. And as China has now created a new military base in Djibouti, I would suggest it would be highly likely that what we would see would be a deployment of Chinese military force, and that's not in Chinese national interests. China has long had a policy of non-interference. That policy has served China well. And if China begins to get involved at this level in smaller foreign countries, it's highly likely it will be drawn in. And we can see this in the case of Sudan already. When I interviewed the leaders of Chinese oil firms in 2007, they were thrilled with their investments in Sudan. They had one president, they had one country, and they had relative peace. Now we've got what? Two countries, a civil war, a Chinese special envoy, Chinese peacekeepers, dead Chinese peacekeepers. I would suggest this is a lesson that China should learn and should inform our decision to vote negative on the One Belt, One Road. A speculation crisis is also highly possible. For us here in Zhongnan High, it would be terrible if a foreigners would collect large amounts of foreign current Chinese currency and then leverage our policy. If we use so much renminbi abroad, we should expect the Warren Buffets of the world to collect our currency and leverage us just like they did in 1998 with other Asian countries. We wouldn't be surprised. A political crisis. Xi Jinping may be a great leader, but he's as human as anyone in this room. He can get sick or worse. What happened to those who remember the Nong Ye Shui Da Jai, the agriculture study Da Jai? 10-year movement, 75 and 76, they had massive conferences. What happened in 77, 78? Gone. Any policy driven by one man's initiative is only as stable as the health of that one man. 
and I don't know the future, I can't predict. But what I can tell you is putting this kind of bet on one man's decision would be the most risky proposition I've seen in a long time. And then finally, let me leave you with perhaps the greatest concern, an identity crisis. What does China stand for if it only stands for itself? If it is only a lender? If China decides to turn debt into equity stakes, as it has done in Sri Lanka, then it will have to deal with all of those local challenges that foreign owners do. And ultimately, it's likely to begin interfering in the internal affairs of these countries. Chinese friends from their history books may remember the Baolu Yundong from 1910-1911. And to introduce to our foreign friends here. This was arguably the birth of Chinese nationalism. It was when the corrupt Qing government took loans from foreigners and gave them equity stakes to build railways in China. And it contributed directly to the fall of the Qing dynasty and a decade of warlordism. Those foreign lenders who made those loans, who took those stakes, could never have known the far-reaching consequences of what they deemed as economic decisions. But now China's on the other side. China's the lender. But its loans may have a similar effect. In fact, we've already seen this happening in Venezuela already. The domestic implications of this are, go beyond simply Chinese national interests. They go to China's image, who China wants to be in the world. I think we should take a more conservative approach. I think we should follow Deng Xiaoping and feel the stones to cross the river, not jump into the middle with the most expensive thing we can do. And I would urge you to follow me and to heed the concerns of the unintended consequences that can occur when we go willy-nilly into dozens, not one or two, but dozens of foreign countries, thick with culture, thick with religion, and themselves deemed by lenders in the Western world to be not necessarily good bets when it comes to repayment. Finally, I want to ask you to judge this debate round on one thing alone, the principle of do no harm. Who is likely to do less harm? A massive one-man-led initiative or a more conservative approach where we feel the stones to cross the river and we invest and we lend to those who can actually pay us back. Thank you very much. So apparently Josh Eisenman used to be a high school debater and I didn't know that. Um, so maybe he has a bit of an edge, but we'll let the facts speak for themselves. So we will turn back now uh, to Professor Joe. And uh, so uh, Josh has, you may sit here or the podium, whichever you wish. Um, and he has raised concerns about mounting debt and um, he's asked you to address the issue of whether China can be a cultural superpower. You have five minutes to uh, address any of these uh, concerns uh, that he has raised. So over to you, please. Thank you, uh, Jessica. So I'd like to make some points just to response. The first point is not, uh, you said that the TPP is not to isolate China. My point is not, if anybody, or if somebody wants to isolate China, BRI will be of some use. So this, is, this will be of some significant, uh, strategic significance. And if no one wants to isolate China, that is very welcomed by China. So the first point. The second point is to the use of that, uh, such as the Sri Lanka mining program is not successful and even it's unsuccessful. I have visited um, many countries along the the route of Belt and Road, and, uh, and I also talked uh, with many companies inside China from Guangdong province, not from Beijing, not state-owned companies. Uh, of course, there are a lot of questions, but uh, also I feel that uh, BRI has a very important uh, function that uh, nowadays we can see so many Chinese people and uh, Chinese companies, they are, how to say, going abroad, and uh, they are, this is a learning curve. Many Chinese people are learning so much about the international society, the good side and the bad side of the international society, and this is a treasure for the long-term uh, development of China, and so this is very useful. And there are also there are certainly some bad, uh, how to say, in, uh, experience. That's, that's something that's okay. And I feel that, uh, in fact, it's still too early to uh, evaluate uh, comprehensively about the BRI. So I dare not to say it is a success or it's unsuccessful. But I should say that uh, it has some use. Well, I'd like to make an example. For example, the last year, the Chinese relation 
with the Philippines have been changed, transformed uh, how to dramatically in about just one year's time. And uh, in fact, I think BI played some role, but that is not uh, very direct because when the, how to say, the president of the Philippines wanted to change his relation with China, BI provides an uh, existing name, framework, and uh, cooperation model for the two sides for the rapid progress of the cooperation. And it gives the Philippines a clear explanation and given them more certainty on the cooperation prospect and facilitates the rapid strengthening of the bilateral relations. I have a feeling that if there is not, this process would be much slower and complicated without the Bert and Road Initiative. It provides a good background for the for the two sides to enhance their relation in a short time. The third point that uh, you have mentioned, a very important side of BI, that is the bike fire. This is very important because this year we can say the relation between China and India is not very satisfactory to, the, to China. But uh, maybe we can think over this question. Why India is, uh, uh, why India is not very satisfied with China? It's because the BI. Well, it's because that China's influence is rising rapidly in South Asia. If India is, if in any way China's influence will in, uh, increase in South Asia, India will how to say objective, objective, then the logic is that if we want to keep a stable China-India relation, we should do nothing in South Asia. So maybe this is not something, uh, it's not a good choice. And, and, and I think maybe this is an indicator of another side, because India is very unsatisfied with China, just because China's influence is increasing very fast in South Asia. So any story has two sides, but uh, so how to balance? I think this is not a, balance, not a bad thing, but uh, we should try to manage the relation with India. This is the third point. The fourth point, uh, you say that you made many Chinese scholars, they, do not, they are not supportive to BI. In fact, this is interesting because my I at first is not very supportive because this this is not my logic because we are I am majored in international relations we are how to say realism we think power politics is more natural and what Chinese do is not what how to say this kind of logic but I think I feel that in fact it's not bad for the world and in fact in the long term I think it's not bad for China. If we want to return to the power, politic power politics, it will be very insufficient both to China and the United States and the neighboring countries. So maybe it will be successful in the short term, but it will not work in the long term. So this is just my several points. My time is you start. Thank you. All right, great job. Josh, five minutes, whatever you wish to rebut. Thank you. Um, I'm going to first uh, mention a couple of points that uh, uh, Dr. Joe mentioned. Um, actually, maybe I should begin by saying that I gave you guys a list of crises, and Dr. Joe hasn't rebutted them, which means that, at least in my experience, you have to consider them. If he hasn't been able to explain why a major debt crisis, which we've seen before, why the interventions and speculation of foreign speculators, all the things I've listed, the security concerns, who's seen Wolf Warrior II, right, the issues that I've laid out for you, if these are not addressed and they have not been, I would suggest you must take them seriously. Um, second, I would agree with Dr. Joe that, you know, maybe it's a little too early to evaluate, but the problem is it's been almost five years now, right? Well, yes. I mean, almost, right? Um, if we can't evaluate this in five years, then the whole point of the round kind of goes out the window, right? At some point, we have to make a decision of whether this is something we want to do or we don't want to do. And I would suggest to you that if it's been five years and we can't decide we want to do it, maybe we shouldn't do it, right? <laughs> that maybe that says something to us if we're not confident after five years. Um, in terms of India, Dr. Joe left out something. China is driving this road through Indian territory or at least disputed territory. Right? Pakistan and India dispute the territory. So India is not going to sign on to something any more than China would sign on if I run a, a railway through you know, Chinese disputed territory. So the fact is that the One Belt, One Road has driven a wedge between China and India. 
right? So I would, I would actually agree with his comments on this. This has been problematic. In fact, I would add that to my list, right? This is one reason you shouldn't vote for this, because it's done such harm to the China-India relationship. And the China-India relationship is important, and it's essential for stability. So as long as China's going to drive its one belt, one road through questionable territories, I would suggest that at least it has to rethink the one belt, one road. Um, <clears throat> In terms of, this is a way, Dr. Joe talked about this being a way to enhance bilateral relations. You know, China's been around for 5,000 glorious years, and it hasn't necessarily had one belt, one road, and it has had relations with countries on its borders and, and abroad. So I don't think one belt, one road is necessary. It may or may not be helpful, but I don't think it's necessary for China to have robust relations. In fact, uh, Senator Cornyn talked about the peaceful rise theory that China had promulgated for years that was very successful. The Taogang Yanghui, bide your time and hide your capability strategy, the modest approach that Deng Xiaoping, Hu Jintao, and others uh, uh, took, I, I think you're hard pressed to find anyone who would say it wasn't successful. So before you decide to turn away from success, you must have something which you feel confident will be better. And I think I've raised enough questions for you to ask yourself whether or not this is truly better than what we've seen in the past, the more modest approach that has been so successful for China in expanding its relations with countries around the world, including the United States. In fact, it's the more aggressive, more assertive China's approach that leads us to comments like we heard from Senator Cornyn today. Right? It is this more aggressive, ag assertive approach which leads countries in Chinese strategic periphery, including India, to be deeply concerned. So I would actually argue the opposite. I would say belt one belt, one road is actually detrimental in this regard, that China can do much better if it doesn't have a grand overarching strategy, but instead finds opportunities and takes those opportunities. If it feels the stones to cross the river rather than jumping into the middle. That such an approach has been successful and would continue to be successful if it were only pursued. China has turned away from this approach, as we can see. But I think that that is a folly. And I would, I, I would argue that in five years we're going to see what a folly it is. So I would ask you to join me negating today's resolution and taking a more modest and conservative approach to this initiative. Thank you. Okay, now we have, uh, I think, about 20 minutes uh, for all of you to pose questions uh, to both of our speakers. You can either pose a question to one um, or to both of them. Um, and uh, once again, please wait until the microphone uh, is brought to you. Identify yourself and uh, make your question short. Uh, so who would like to ask the first question? Okay, over here at this table. Uh, thank you, Cinnamon Dornslave, Johns Hopkins Sice. Um, this is a question for Josh. Um, in terms of the um, securitizing assets and loans, um, what gives you assurances that China would consider that as a strategy? Um, secondly, what would you say to the massive reserves that China owns uh, and its, willing, it, it, its ability and possible willingness to self-insure? Okay, Josh. Well, that's an excellent question. I did my master's at SICE, so go Blue Jays. Um, so in terms of the securitization of loans, well, it's already happening. At least that's what Chinese professors have told me. The issue has been the securitization of domestic loans to this point. And there's been a firewall, at least I was told, between the foreign loans and the domestic loans. But the fact is that this is not a public announcement. This is what one professor who studies this told me. And so there is no public discussion of whether or not that firewall will come down at some point. Right? And it, we'd almost expect that it would, right? That, that China wouldn't want to hold massive loans in its banks, that it would want to make, set that money to work, right? Um, but you know, the problem is also, you know, I, I want to I add another problem here, which would be uh, inflation, right? I mean, if these loans go bad and you've got to continually recapitalize banks, you're increasing the monetary supply. Inflation brought down the Guomindang government. It, it, in other countries around the world have suffered with inflation. It's kind of the silent killer. We never know when it's going to strike, but if you keep adding money to the money supply. So the, the issue of securitization is something that's already happening. Whether or not it's happening with one belt, one road debt, I, I can't speak to. But there's also other questions. In terms of this uh, 
issue of reserves. Now, many of us have seen Chinese reserves falling over the last few uh, uh, years. I think they've gone from about $4 trillion to 3 if I'm not mistaken, which is still a quite a lot of money. And I have no doubt that China might want to bring its ample reserves to bear, um, especially if we saw a speculation attack on the Chinese currency, which is it would be most helpful. But what China is not doing is using that money. It's, it's, what it's doing is it's lending money with, from state-owned banks to state-owned enterprises who then go out, build the projects, and then get repaid to China. So I'm not sure that those reserves are necessarily helpful in terms of this debt issue. They are helpful, though, in warding off a speculation attack against the Chinese currency. Okay. Our next question right over here. Hi, Patricia Kim from the Council on Foreign Relations. So Josh, I'm convinced about your argument on the long-term economic risks um, that the Belt and Road Initiative poses for China, but I think in some ways you've overlooked the fact that China has succeeded already in, if it's in the strategic dimension of projecting itself as the leading power with this BRI by having countries um, realize that they need to start gravitating towards China if they want to reap benefits. But um, I think you're also right that there may be a tipping point where countries begin to feel um, increasingly worried about Chinese influence. Um, so there is a tipping point. So I want to you know, ask you to address that and ask Professor Zhou to address. So what measures will China take to assure countries that they don't need to be afraid? Because I'm sure this is a discussion that Chinese leaders have had. So how can China reassure other countries that it's not going to use its influence in a way that's detrimental to other people's national interests? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Hmm? Do you want to start or do you want them to go? You first. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for your question, and I hope everyone in the room agrees with you and me at this point. Um, so this question of a, of a tipping point, right? You know, we've had this great event in, in May uh, this year, May 15th. Actually, I remember the date because I arrived in Beijing Airport that day, um, and it was impossible to get a flight to Shanghai because of all of the One Belt, One Road, Mission Gas. So the countries of the world showed up for that event in big ways, right? And they showed up because everybody shows up when the loan gets handed out, right? When your banker gives you the loan, of course you're there. But what about when you have to repay? Sometimes it's hard to find you, right? And so I would say, yes, of course, every country is going to show up and sing China's praises when the money's on the table. But when the difficult time comes, when repayment comes, uh, I think you might be harder pressed to find them. And so I would argue that would be the tipping point. The tipping point is when you begin to collect your money. Right? When that, so it's easy, they're gonna of course welcome you, in, you know, to their country when you're handing them the money. But the tipping point comes when the difficult issues of on the ground uh, uh, problems emerge, and then you've gotta deal with them. And in Sri Lanka, you have a new airport, nobody's using it, right? So that's a problem. And so the Chinese have taken equity stakes and, and then they're gonna to have to deal with a whole bunch of issues on the ground. So there's a tipping point for China, and I would argue that tipping point is when it gets so heavily involved domestically that it begins to challenge its own interference principle. And the tipping point for the other countries is the point that they have to pay back money they don't have. And then that leads to tension in the bilateral relationship with China. So I would say that, uh, that those are the kind of two tipping points, one for China and one uh, uh, for the other countries. Um, and I'll leave for uh, Dr. Joe perhaps the final question of what will China do when these two tipping points occur. <laughs> okay, Professor Joe, and the question was how should China reassure these countries? Uh, yeah, thank you. How should China reassure? I think uh, this, the question is not so, the situation is not so complex. Uh, in fact, uh, many countries, uh, they want to attract or foreign investment. And uh, BRI is something highly voluntary. China does not force any country to do things, to do uh, things in the China's, how to say, way or China's pace. In fact, we can say there are about uh, 70 countries, but the cooperation is very diversified. So even every country has its own uh, different uh, way of doing things, and uh, we can say that uh, even the China, the Thailand uh, highway have been talking about so many years and being promoted at the high, most the highest, the highest level of Chinese government and the Thailand government, but it is, it is now still do not put into effect. So, and another thing is that uh, 
BRI is just the one choice. And uh, now, when China are promoting the initiative, so the, con the country related to this, they have more choice. So this is a good thing to any country. You can a choice from uh, assistance from other countries or from the WB or ADB or, or BRI, anything is okay, and the China's experience is not. But the, how to say, the preliminary stage of development, attracting foreign investment is very important, such as uh, the Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping said that you want to get rich, you pave road first. Yao Xiang Hu, Xian Xiu Lu. Yes. So, in fact, the BRI is something to build a road in the how to say, many in developing countries. This is a good uh, thing for them, and uh, it's a choice. You cannot, uh, you, can accept, uh, you can accept it, and you can reject it, it's okay. So I think uh, this, and uh, another thing is that China in, is uh, giving some favorable condition to them. So in fact, this is good news, but uh, some countries, they still want more favorable condition. So this is the real question. Thank you. You want 30 seconds? Yeah, 30 okay, seconds. all right, um, go ahead. I mean, I, I just want to indicate that some countries pushing back is exactly what I'm talking about, right? Indonesia got a better deal than Thailand. Thailand pushed back and said, we're not letting you build a damn thing until we get the deal Indonesia got. That's moral hazard problem. There it is. He laid it out for you. Also, you have to think investment. This is not investment. A loan is not investment. Investment is investment. I invest in you. I take an equity stake. I'm lending you money. And so it's very important that we use these terms because a lot of journalists use these terms interchangeably, but they're not interchangeable. So it's important that we understand that this is debt driven. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question is, and is blocked by our podiums, please just stand up because I, um, have, I can't, can't see um, everybody here. Uh, so um, yeah, well, we have, we, have, we have several questions. Okay, so um, we'll go first uh, back over there. We still have more than 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. Uh, Gautam Adhikari, I'm from the Center for American Progress. Uh, we are supposed to take uh, a position on China's desired strategic and economic gains through the BRI. So Dr. Zhou, what exactly is China's global strategic goal? It's very easy to say uh, peace and stability and stuff like that. But as uh, Dr. Eisenman pointed out, that sometimes the BRI might be working against that goal, at least in the regional context. In the case of South Asia, for instance, China and India have a good bilateral economic relationship. China has actually replaced the US uh, as the leading trading partner of, uh, of, China, of, of India. And yet the BRI is coming in because of the various other initiatives that have been taken under it, to spoil that relationship. And this is happening in other places as well. Bangladesh, there's a problem with the Rohingya crisis. What kind of position is China going to take on that? Uh, it's supporting the Burmese uh, military uh, in, uh, uh, initiative, if you can call it that. So I was just wondering whether you'd like to come in, and maybe Dr. Eisenman also. Okay, Dr. Zhao. I just, uh, the China's uh, strategic goal, is, I just mentioned, is that, uh, in fact, BRI is not a strategy, it is an initiative. And uh, in fact, it's not so, and uh, anything BRI can do is just uh, subjective to the national, how to say, strategy of China. That is the, how the two century goals to achieve the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. In fact, we can see that the domestic development is put at the priority. And uh, in fact, international influence is something, how to say, it's just additional. It's not, not uh, the priority of Chinese government. And another thing you just talk, uh, mentioned about the Chinese relation with India. So I'd like to say something about this. I have been to India two times just after the BI is, uh, how to say, proposed. And I, just, and I also, encouraged some Chinese government uh, company to invest in India, but I feel guilty to them because uh, after one year, I know in fact uh, the, how to say, investment uh, condition is not very good and uh, they are not, uh, uh, how to say, any money there. But uh, uh, just, uh, just for say something that uh, China's, uh, China, Pakistan, how to say, economic corridor, just pass through the, how to say, Indians 
uh, disputed uh, territory. But I think this is a misleading story because, in fact, in the 1970s, China built roads to Pakistan. And in fact, China is now, if we want to go from China to Pakistan, we have to pass this Kashmir place, but it is actually controlled by Pakistan for so many years. It is not a problem for many, many years, but nowadays it becomes a problem. So it is just, uh, how to say, uh, how to say, uh, a saying by the Indian part. I, I, feel, I have a feeling, yes. Okay, in the back. Wait for the microphone, please. The gentleman's standing right there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yang. I'm a reporter from Shenzhen Media. Um, my question is to Joshua. Um, so you mentioned several factors that the CPC should consider before it carry out the One Belt, One Road initiative. But from my opinion, I think those factors, I mean, th those are very good uh, arguments, but I think those factors are quite basic, not for me, not for random people, but for the people in Zhongnanhai. The experts, the scholars, and the think tank people around Xi Jinping, I think they have already been considered. And if, it is, if they were not considered, I totally agree with you that this one belt, one road should not be carried out at the, for, for sure. Um, but then you, you mentioned that um, even if they are already considered, the CPC should be uh, confident before it really decides to carry out this new style of um, diplomacy instead of being conservative. So my question is, how do you define confidence? I mean, if you look back to the uh, history of CPC, um, so many policies of itself ha was not, uh, were not conservative at all. If, if the CPC had been so conserv uh, conservative, I don't think it would have been as successful as it seems today. So my, uh, my question is mainly, how do you define this confidence? How do you um, say, okay, it is for sure that we're gonna be successful, then we have to, ca we, we can carry out this new initiative or this new style of diplomacy. Thank you. That's an excellent question, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> First, I would say that the comments I've presented to you today are informed by historical precedents. They're things that have happened in the past. And so, yeah, I, I think the people in Jonah and I should be taking them under consideration. I guess my concern is the highly politicized nature of this initiative, which leads this to be pushed forward regardless of whether or not people have concerns on these issues. And I can tell you that there, these kinds of issues are, are reflected in the comments that I was hearing from Chinese professors, particularly econ economists, even people at the NDRC. But as they re said to me with regret, they're unsure that people are reading the memos they're sending, that it seems the policy process has begun, it's taken on a life of its own. So I would question whether or not uh, these issues have been sufficiently thought through. And I certainly don't know what's going on in Zhongnanhai. I, I wouldn't claim that I do, but I think that we in this room, having not known if they've thought about it or not, need to be cautious and, and err on the side of caution. Um, in, in terms of this question of confidence, you say that the Communist Party of China has not been conservative, and I would differentiate. I would say that domestically, in fact, the Communist Party of China has been quite bold in a lot of ways. Creating the, the People's Commune is a bold initiative. Getting rid of the People's Commune is a bold initiative. Reform and opening up. I mean, China domestically has engaged in bold domestic initiatives. However, it's done so usually with a model that it's tested. It's tested something to see if it works and then implemented it on a wide scale. And what we're doing with One Belt, One Road is not testing, we're jumping into the middle of it without enough testing that even after five years, we're still unsure. So I would say that domestically, that's been the way it is. However, I would draw a distinction internationally. Internationally, I would argue China has been conservative. China has felt the stones to cross the river. China has adhered by Deng Xiaoping's admiration to bide your time and hide your capabilities. So I would differentiate. And this is an international initiative. So domestically, yes, I would agree with you. But internationally, and here on this stage right now, we're dealing internationally, I would suggest this is a new type of initiative. This is something well beyond what we've seen in the past. And I'd ask you to consider this differentiation in your decision today. Okay, we have a question at the uh, front table over here. If somebody would bring the microphone up. Uh, 
Uh, thanks. Mitchell Stanley with the National Center for Sustainable Development. Uh, just a quick question. You weren't comparing the Great Leap Forward to the Belt and Road, One Road Initiative, were you? Um, I, I would compare any politically driven economic strategy, right? So the, the Great Leap Forward led to disaster. But prior to the Great Leap Forward, people were very bullish on it. People thought quite a lot of it, as they do One Belt, One Road now, according to the, well, yeah, the those, initial poll. Uh, so I can't predict what totally the un, un, uh, Sorry, can I? Un, unrelated to what's going on today. Um, How can you say that? The, belt one, uh, you know, the Great Leap Forward is a Russian uh, plan uh, for China. Uh, you know, they're taking their, their plans from Russia in that case. But my really, the case I'm trying to make is that in, the, in your perspective, which is a very American perspective on the Belt Road Initiative, haven't they really reinstating something that they are very familiar with from really from a thousand years ago? Yeah. Um, I just, just one point of clarification. The Russians hated the Great Leap Forward and condemned it, right? So this is not that this was a fully Chinese initiative, the Great Leap Forward, as Chinese as one belt, one road. So the, in fact, Mao Zedong was criticized heavily from Khrushchev, and the Great Leap Forward contributed directly to the Sino-Soviet split. So I would take issue with that. But I would agree with you, however, that this is reminiscent of a thousand years ago. But the problem is it ain't a thousand years ago, right? This is a, this is a globalized world. This is a, a interconnected world. This is a world where the U.S. and China are not competitors economically, they're collaborators economically, right? Where, you know, China will import from Africa to make products and sell those products to Bangkok, Beijing, and Boston, right? So I think that if we take the strategies of a thousand years ago, try to recreate them, repackage them, and resell them today, I think that's a loser. I don't think that can be successful. I think what we need is new and innovative approaches, which have new and innovative strategies based on the realities that exist as they exist today, not when we rode camels and horses. So I think it's an essential element of what we're doing that we don't do what we did a thousand years ago. And I think that that point, which I entirely agree with, only kind of underscores the point that this is something we should do with great caution. And, and just to get to your initial point, I was mentioning the Great Leap Forward only because it is a politically driven economic policy. And I can name others. Um, I mentioned that one too. And I can sit here and mention numerous of them if we need be. But the point is, my view is that when you make economic decision based on politics, you get bad outcomes. And I think we see that replete in Chinese history. And if we go ahead, don't learn from that history, and we go and do it again, well, then we shouldn't be surprised if it doesn't work. OK, we have a question. This gentleman's been waiting right here. Hey there, my name is Shu Yang Huang from GW. Uh, I have a question. Uh, after President Trump visit to China, uh, Trump and Xi made some big deals. One of them is uh, China will not limit the share of the uh, finance company and insurance company. They put the share up to 51% uh, right now. So that means foreign investor can um, like hold the assets in China. Does that mean anything? I mean, bring some positive impact to the One Belt and One Road initiative? Um, because uh, Josh mentioned the lending power before and uh, some Federal Reserve questions. So I want uh, Professor Zhou to answer this question. Will this bring any positive impact, uh, impact to uh, One Belt and One Road initiative? Uh, the f uh, foreign investor or foreign company can hold more than 50% of the shares in okay. uh, insurance company or finance company. Okay. So uh, the deal between President Xi and President Tom, uh, uh, Trump is something I think uh, just to show to the outside world that China, the one side is not China is going abroad rapidly. Another side is China is also opening more up to the outside world. So this is a very important, uh, how to say, uh, lesson experience China have learned in the past years. I feel that uh, this is the uh, first uh, uh, gesture that China is willing, highly willing to cooperate with the United States, and uh, in fact. As to the trade relation, also even even the investment relationship, China is as a common Chinese people. I many Chinese people are not very satisfied to the United States. United States, even you can receive read back from uh, the older leaders, former leaders, Deng Xiaoping. He said he is not satisfied with China United relations because you have a technical control to China, 
and nowadays it is real, you know, real. it's not uh, give much, much. So, but uh, no matter how, even the Donald Trump's pony, uh, policy is American first, China also wants to cooperate with the United States. So this is a suggestion, what China, how the China's way of doing things, China's preference, so maybe we can learn something. China's logic is not so, how to say, zero-sum or how, so confronting. So I think uh, we should uh, have some confidence on China. China will be more open in the coming years, but it takes time. Yeah, thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time for this debate, but we are going to vote now. Um, and so if you please take out your clickers. <clears throat> the proposition again is the Belt and Road Initiative will achieve China's desired strategic and economic gains. And you will please vote either yes or no. We started out with 42% voting yes and 36% voting no. By the way, you, you can only vote once if you keep hitting your clickers. You're only gonna get one vote. You can change your vote, but you're only getting one vote. <laughs> we'll give everybody uh, a minute to get their votes up and uh, we'll see whether there has been significant change. There's more people in the room than there are numbers up there. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping you are all getting your vote registered. And if your clicker is not working, if you don't see it light up, please do raise your hand. We have uh, extras sometimes uh, the, the, the battery gives out. Um, Bonnie, in the interest of fairness, I think we should do this in Chinese next year. Next year, okay, we'll do it in Chinese. And I'm confident, Josh, that you could do as good a job in Chinese as you, uh, as you did in English. Okay, well, I think that's going to be our final numbers. We have 46% voting yes and 53% voting no. So um, this has been a terrific debate and we have switched and congratulations. All right, want to thank both of you for a terrific debate. Yep. We're gonna break for 15 minutes. In early August, North Korea threatened to launch four intermediate-range ballistic missiles to a point about 30 or 40 kilometers off the coast of Guam. Tom, could you walk us through how U.S. missile defense systems would respond if such a launch was detected? So if that happens, the United States would first detect the missile's heat signatures with satellites